Hi, I'm Jay Watson. Uh, I teach technology, uh, website development, and coding at Cookville High School. Uh, this summer, I participated in a research project here at Tennessee Tech. Uh, this presentation, entitled The Development of a Framework for 3D Printing, Casting, and Entrepreneurship, highlights that research. Matt Stoltz, uh, founder of both 3D Printing Providence and Hack Pitchburg, specifies that although the capability of 3D printing filaments is incredible uh, due to the ability of modern printers to print in strong, flexible, glowing, and dissolvable plastic, sometimes a part, uh, sometimes we need a metal part. And that is the essence of my research, uh, the viability of casting. So why am I a part of this project? Uh, that is because of a uh, supplement from the National Science Foundation uh, Research Experiences for Teachers. Uh, so in order to do this, you need to have a funded uh, NSF research and development project. Uh, this was also the supplement was part of an NSF funded research experience for undergrads site, uh, which TTU is one of those sites. Uh, the application was submitted in the spring of 2016 and was accepted in early summer 2016 after the, the search process, uh, which was rather facilitated uh, to identify a suitable candidate. I was selected and it was an incredible experience for me. I, I learned a lot. So I'm uh, incredibly thankful for that. Uh, to further clarify, TTU is actually one of two uh, NSF funded uh, research experience for undergrad sites. And each year, around 10 undergrads will participate and perform a cutting edge research. Uh, the 3D printed a dinosaur is an example of one of the uh, projects that, that they've completed. And so there's a lot of cool things happening here at Tennessee Tech. Um, in 2016, a teacher was added, and of course, that, that teacher was added to me, and that was with that RET supplement. Uh, my research was primarily threefold. Uh, so, first, uh, we want to talk about the viability of sand casting. Uh, is it still a viable process in the 21st century? Uh, two, the efficiency and effectiveness of rapid prototyping. And three, uh, to assist a TTU engineering student with his entrepreneurial endeavors. I do want to give a special thanks to several individuals. Uh, the REU students uh, that I worked with a lot this summer, these are the guys who did the 3D printed dinosaur. Uh, Nick, Jacob, and Joe. Uh, smart guys and also uh, very helpful. Uh, so there was a lot of software, which I will discuss later, that I had to learn how to use to adequately uh, do this research, and these guys were incredibly helpful. Uh, Dr. Vondra, uh, some of you may know him. He's over the TTU Foundry. A lot of people probably aren't aware of all the cool things they have going on there, uh, but he's over that and he was very helpful. He uh, provided technical assistance. He also cast the prototypes uh, for our research. And then Dr. Fadon, without Dr. Fadon, none of this would be possible. Uh, he works incredibly hard, is helpful, and then he's, he's just an incredible asset for Tennessee Tech. So first I'd like to give a bit of a process overview. And the, the first step was to uh, basically design the prototypes. And for that, we pretty much use three uh, different software programs. We utilize SolidWorks, Autodesk, AutoCAD, um, and even Google SketchUp. And it's actually a free, uh, yet uh, surprisingly powerful program that you can download online. And the two that I specifically worked with were SketchUp and SolidWorks. Um, and then uh, one of the REU students actually utilized AutoCAD, and he assisted with some of the designs. Uh, once a prototype was designed, uh, we would then print that, uh, and then we would use that as our tool uh, to actually cast that prototype. And a tool in the sand casting world just defines uh, the part that you use to create the cavity to pour the metal into, uh, so to create your mold. Uh, the 3D printing, uh, the 3D printers uh, that I use, I use the Ultimaker 2 Extended, uh, which is over there. Uh, here in the iMaker space, and then I use the MakerBot replicator uh, Z18. I'm sorry, the MakerBot is here in the iMaker space, uh, and uh, the Ultimaker 2 Extended uh, is uh, in Lewis Hall, and I also use the PrinterBot Simple Metal. Um, out of these three printers, uh, I preferred the Ultimaker 2 Extended. It was reliable, uh, and it also printed incredibly high-quality prints. 
Um, the, it, the replicator, um, sometimes it would have like a surface warp to it. And obviously this is a small representative sample. So definitely take that into consideration. Uh, with that noted, uh, just anecdotally, the REU students experience the same thing that I'm describing. Uh, the printer bot Simple Metal is just a five six hundred dollar printer, and for that dollar figure, I thought it performed quite well. Um, but using that to print the prototypes automatically caused me to have to do more post processing once the the part was cast. Here's a chart that I created just to review the pros and cons, and you can see that the the MakerBot is uh, significantly more expensive. At $6,500, the Ultimaker is about $3,000, and then the printer bot Simple Metal is quite a bit cheaper. Uh, the Microns is what uh, describes the print quality, and you can see that the Ultimaker actually has the highest potential uh, print quality. Of course, that's you know would vary depending upon a lot of other factors uh, that that you could configure. Uh, one advantage, if you were uh, purchasing a printer to create a prototype, one advantage that the MakerBot would have is that that larger print bed size. And so that would be something to consider. Uh, the sand casting process uh, for all the prototypes, uh, we actually attempted to cast them in iron, aluminum, and bronze. Uh, due to the inexperience of this research, some of the items, a few of them were unable to be cast. And so overall, we, we, uh, I'll show you some pictures. We, we got some great results. Uh, but some of them, uh, due to a uh, challenge that everyone has to deal with in the sand casting process, the, the parts weren't able to, to be uh, designed like we would like. Um, an interesting note is that molten iron was actually the most fluid, which means for like detailed objects, uh, it was able to flow into the cavity and fill that area uh, better uh, than the other metals. Uh, so the, just a quick overview of the sand casting process. So you would prepare the materials. Um, which includes the heating of the molten metal in the foundry. They have uh, different furnaces they use for the uh, various alloys. Uh, we would then place the prototype into the, uh, into the drag, which is the bottom part of the flask, and the flask is just your mold. Uh, and we would then pack silica sand onto that, uh, and then we would use a tool called a rammer uh, to make the sand tight around that object. Uh, we would then flip the drag, and we would create what's referred to as a gating system, which essentially is just a pathway uh, for the metal to flow into the cavity. Uh, we would then place the coat, which is the top portion of the flask. And you see there's uh, pictures. Actually, let me flip back. You can probably see it better here. Uh, you can see where you have the flask, and you can see where there are two parts of that, and that's the, the cope and drag. Uh, so we would then place the cope, the top part, on the drag, and, uh, and then pack that full of sand, and that's where we would do, uh, carve out the sprue, uh, which is just the place to pour in the metal. Uh, you have to have that opening. Um, once, um, and then of course, we'd have to remove the pattern from the sand, uh, put the cope and drag back together, um, and then you would loosely apply clamps, uh, not tight, and then you pour the molten metal, and we would have to, of course, wait for it to cool. This is just a table that I created that is an overview of the results. And I have a weight and a cost listed. And some of the items, if you notice, they're, they're missing like this shaving cup that I, that I designed. Uh, and uh, we weren't able to get a good cast out of that out of bronze, but we were able to get a good iron and aluminum cast. And that was, was due to the learning process. But if you look at the uh, item cost there, uh, one thing that jumps out is you can see that bronze is significantly more expensive than anything else. Uh, one thing to note, though, is, of course, market prices for these alloys fluctuate frequently. Uh, so this was at the time of the research. Uh, this is a more uh, graphical depiction of the weight. And, of course, you're probably not surprised by aluminum being significantly lighter than bronze or iron. I was, however, surprised that bronze was actually heavier than iron. I did not. I did not realize that or the particular alloy we were using. Um, and you can see that overall they're pretty close in weight though. In the cost comparison, and this is probably not, if you're familiar with this, this is not surprising, but you can see the bronze is significantly more expensive. Uh, so if you take an item like this shaving stand, okay, if you take an item like that, you can see that the cost in bronze would be approximately $16. The actual cost would be on the table uh, based on the market cost at that time. And then for aluminum, 
uh, approximately a dollar for iron, uh, 50 cents. And that's even considering that iron is significantly heavier than aluminum. Problems faced in the casting process. And um, the big thing with the sand casting process, the big challenge is draft. Um, how many know what draft is in this room? And that's where you have to design it essentially with an angle uh, to where it will actually pull out of the sand. Uh, so uh, here's an example. This is just an illustration that, that I drew up. <laughs> and this is a very simple illustration, but it really drives home the importance of, of this uh, concept. Bad, good. Um, and so on the outside edges, you want a radius. On the inside edges, you also want a radius that's referred to as a fillet. Uh, and then you have to have this angle. And to get uh, like a really good cast, you want to have at least five to six degrees minimum. Now there are other factors. So uh, for example, um, this was printed by uh, the maker bot, um, I'm sorry, the printer bot Simple Metal. And due to that fact, I think it's like 50 microns compared to, uh, you know, I think 300 and 600 microns for the other two printers. Uh, but it's, you can see the, if it was a picture, it'd be resolution, uh, but you can feel the grain. And so I didn't do a whole lot of sanding here. Um, and if I would have like sprayed this with a clear coat, it would have performed better. Um, and I think the draft on this was actually four degrees. Uh, but minimum recommended uh, from Dr. Vondra was five to six degrees. And for other objects, you would actually, you could need more. Uh, and Dr. Vondra, he explained this concept. And I can tell you that uh, as I was trying to design some of these parts, you know, there was like a give and take. So, hey, I want to create or create some kind of like foam stand. Well, you're limited. You don't want to give this too much draft or it completely changes your design. Or you have to think of a new way to design it. And so that was kind of... Uh, a challenge there. Uh, when I actually got into the foundry and worked with casting these objects, I realized real quick that you had to pay attention to that. Some of the items that I did not have enough draft, we weren't able to get good cast, or it just required more post-processing on my part. Um, so a solution can be achieved in most cases uh, if you're creative, and then of course if you can split the part into several pieces, um, and of course investment casting would be a solution, but it's an entirely different uh, type of casting. Uh, Post-processing. So you can see there's some parts here. Uh, Batman paperweight, just because I like Batman. and uh, Was initially practicing learning how to use SolidWorks. Uh, and you can see this is like a MacBook stand. And you'll see this here in option. Here's the actual print of that. Um, so initially, I had to just use a grinder. And I just, uh, I had actually uh, access to the auto mechanics classroom at uh, Kubo High School, which was very helpful. And they had, a, they had a big grinder I could use and then also had a hand grinder. And so I would do that initially and get it down to, uh, you know, I'd actually grind off to where the gating system connected to the cast. And then if there was any like major imperfections. Uh, and then the Dremel sanding bit. And this, this was great. Honestly, the Dremel sanding bit, if I could just start off with one thing, that, that would be it. And when I say bit, I mean a, several of those. You want several to change out. But it worked really well and to achieve the finish that I was desiring. Um, I also had a buffer brush kit uh, to attach to my dri uh, drill and a metal compound uh, that I used to really get some items uh, to be shiny. Um, and again, the items printed with the printer bot simple metal required automatically weren't going to have that smooth finish. It would have the same texture finish that the printer had. Uh, you can kind of see this texture right here. So you can see this is because this is printed with that printer bot simple metal. And so part of this research was to determine, okay, if we print with a cheaper printer, you know, how's that going to affect our quality? And if had this been printed with um, one of the other printers, you wouldn't have this texture uh, finish here. Um, these are some of the other uh, items that we cast, and there were quite a few. Uh, so let's discuss the entrepreneurial potential, because that's actually what I think is the most exciting part of this. Um, relatively speaking, 3D printers are, are inexpensive. They, they really are. Um, the sand casting process is, is relatively inexpensive. Uh, and so I think for businesses and individuals, this is a real feasible way of taking your concept, your idea, and then just building it. And it's not overly expensive. And I don't recommend this in a way like with a, if you get on YouTube, you can see a lot of people are doing a lot of things that are very unsafe. But if you want proof of this, just uh, you can get on YouTube on the forums and you can see some of the things that people are creating in their backyard, in their, in their garage. And so 
But just for businesses, again, there's just so much. If they have a part that they need to replace, if they have a new uh, product, uh, they can then take that and, um, and just actually create it, build it, uh, instead of having to go through this expensive and long tool and dying process. So at the conclusion of this proje uh, project, everything was given to uh, an entrepreneurial minded student. He already has a smithing business and he actually cast in his, in his backyard, in his garage, actually uh, went over to his house and worked with him there. And he has, he has a pretty nice setup. And so all these items were given him to help him out with that uh, business endeavor. Um, so, and he actually designed these knives, uh, short swords actually. Uh, which which I thought were pretty cool. And you can see there's the iron castings, the aluminum, and the bronze casting. Um, so the student currently has an online storefront. And again, he already possesses significant experience with all these things. And he was instrumental in assisting me too uh, with the development of, of some of these items. So this right here, this is an entirely new um, kind of project. Um, or a product concept that I came up with. And so one of the things when we were thinking about the prototypes that we want to design, well, we thought, okay, we could design jewelry. We know a lot of people are doing it, but we still want to see what kind of quality can we, you know, design, print, and cast, and what kind of quality are we going to get? How much is it going to cost us to do that? Uh, we wanted to look at other items like, okay, replica swords, things like that, um, because that might be something that people are interested in. Uh, and then we thought, so what are some unique items? And so we looked at things like, okay, like a MacBook stand. That's kind of unique. That's kind of hipster. Maybe people would be willing to buy that. Um, this, okay, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the art of shaving. If you go to Cool Springs Galleria in Franklin, they have one of these stores. And if you go in there and you look at the price and you're like me, you're going to be shocked. Um, but evidently people are paying that price. So they have shaving stands that are selling for $130. Um, and just to show you, so I thought, well, let's design a shaving stand because I know that's a crazy amount of markup just because it's this trendy product. And so let's think of, you know, let's design a unique product that people might, that we might be able to actually get this type of markup. And so if you look at this, um, I think that, uh, and again, they're selling that for $130. And if you see, okay, shaving stand and shaving cup, you can see if this is item is cast in aluminum for both of those, it's probably going to be uh, $2, $2.50 for both of those items. And they're selling this for $130. You know, if you could get, obviously, if you could get $80, that's, that's incredible potential. Uh, these are some of the other items. You can see there's pendants, uh, jewelry, uh, earrings. I think I showed on the other slide. This is the MacBook stand here, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, Batman paperweight. So just a little more about this uh, entrepreneurial student. He's an engineering technology sophomore. He has experience and an online storefront. Um, and something else, he's already doing some pretty cool things uh, that I think are kind of innovative. And this is one of the reasons Dr. Fadon uh, wanted to help him out. So for example, I always wanted to forge my own knife. I always thought that would be cool. This student's already like offering that to the public, you know, for $100. And so this goes hand in hand with what he's already doing. Um, this is the website to his Etsy store, and it's uh, Nine Fire Knife Works. And if you look, or on the slide back, uh, this is actually something I drew out in solid works for him, which is just like a large medallion, probably coaster, probably be a really good coaster, um, but I needed to include a bit more draft. But so these are some of the items that he already has posted on that storefront. And you can see like for these short swords, you know, he's charging $70, well it costs about a dollar to make that. And so these are the things that we, we, we really wanted to look at. Same thing for, for these. Uh, this is just an overview of the process. This is what, uh, basically what I've been talking about the entire time. The conclusion of this is this process, of, or my conclusion is that it is a viable and affordable option uh, for taking your ideas and then just creating them. Uh, of course, you have to think about several factors. Uh, the size of what you're attempting to design. Uh, you can get around this if you're creative and maybe you have access to uh, resources that maybe the normal person would not. Uh, so for example, you might be able to split your uh, part into sections and then reassemble it and then use that. Uh, and then that would be your tool uh, to create cast from. Uh, you also think about the type of metal. Uh, different foundries are limited concerning the allo alloys that they cast. 
And then again, if it's sand casting, does the design lend itself to the sand casting process? Because some items, I may have wanted to design them, but I just really couldn't come up with a good way to do it with the sand casting process. Now again, the multiple parts, if you want to put it together on the post-processing end, you can probably get around that. And the 3D design, 3D printing, casting, and then entrepreneurship, that was the model uh, that we went by. Reflections from me. Uh, and for me, this was just an incredible, enriching experience. It was outside of my expertise. I did not have prior experience with 3D modeling software. The first part of this was just spent me trying to get good at using those. And so I think that makes this research even more interesting. Someone with little experience can come in and do these things rather quickly. Uh, and then I wasn't really aware of the sand casting process or all the things that I had to think about, especially like when it says five to six degrees draft minimum, you really want to pay attention to that. Um, and so early research was spent on education. Um, now, one thing that helped me is that I am familiar with technology, so I was able to, I think, learn some of the things quicker because of that. Um, what I do want to say is that in my technology class, this that I teach at the high school, so I teach an information technology class, there are a lot of STEM-related topics that are in the state standards. And before, I provided only a surface introduction, and this will allow me to have, you know, or give students a really hands-on, I think, cool uh, introduction uh, to these topics. And, and with this project, I'll be getting, or with this uh, project, I'll be getting a 3D scanner and 3D printer for the classroom. So it will really pull students in and get their interest. Acknowledgements, uh, again, I want to thank Tennessee Tech University and the National Science Foundation. And if anyone has any questions regarding this, uh, my contact information is on this slide.